The definitions of Hermes Trismegistus to Asclepius is a hermetic text that comes to us by way of a 6th century manuscript, published in an Armenian translation in 1956. It stands alone in that it is not included in the Corpus Hermeticum or the Stobaeus fragments, yet the author of the definitions is certainly familiar with early Hermetica. The nuanced style and wording variation of familiar Hermetic aphorisms leads scholars to believe the core of the definitions dates back to the 1st century AD. Since hermetism is a path of spiritual liberation and not so much an exercise of faith or a mere philosophical doctrine, pithy axioms, sentences, and precepts would have worked neatly for its pupils in their learning process, providing definite guidelines and truisms which the student could firmly cling to, especially if some of the more abstract hermetic teachings were as of yet too difficult to comprehend. But with all things pertaining to spiritual salvation, it is often the case that simple, actionable instructions trump complex metaphysical and theological systems. The definitions are categorically aphoristic. There is no narrative beginning-to-end dialogue, but a sentence-to-sentence, discontinuous reconstruction of hermetic teachings, probably extracted from a broader hermetic corpus. Where it is difficult to memorize whole lectures, core principles can be summarized and serve as mantric objects of repetitive self-learning, which the student can take into the temple alone and use as permission slips in meditation. Thus, these definitions should be understood as tools for the hermetic student to refine their behavior and mental activity in order to defeat the avenging daimons, ascend in silence above the seven spheres up into the eighth and the ninth sphere and ultimately achieve a mystic union with the noose, which can then allow the candidate to transform into the initiate and be reborn in the world as one who retains the noose and so does not speak or act without first giving thought to God and the light and life that sustains our souls and the universe. In previous essays, we have demonstrated certain hermetic visualization techniques and methods of divine service that the reborn initiate can embody in order to increase the supply of enlightened humans, creating an overall compounding effect of divine awareness more focused on spreading behavioral purity than evangelical conversion. Now we must relay many, but not all, of the important hermetic aphorisms in the definitions, while occasionally glancing at other precepts found in the wider hermetica. First we have the challenge of defining nous, which is often rendered as mind or intellect or reason in English translations. However, as is pointed out by Professor Hanegraaff and others, noose is not reducible to intellect or mind, but is more so a supreme consciousness, or an invisible good, which in the Platonic sense is the pre-cosmic God-consciousness of effulgent light and living mind, with which we are capable of harmonizing. There probably will never be an English term that captures the meaning of noose, which is why you will find different scholars have translated it in various ways, either as mind, consciousness, or intellect. But we can think of it as a faculty of consciousness that is directly resonating with the eternal good energies of God. Near the beginning of the text, we read, God is eternal and uncreated. Man is mortal, although he is ever living. Considering God is the ineffable source of all that is, there is nothing outside or beyond it. Man is mortal in that we exist temporarily as embodied souls who die and yet do not die. The body's death may take with it certain aspects of the ego and personality that no longer serve the soul when it transcends the material plane. Death in this way does not mean we leave behind all the memories, relations, and learning we have here, but we take what is appropriate and useful, 
discarding whatever is proper to leave behind, as we are beings with free will, whose consciousness necessarily expands beyond expression in the higher planes. Thus the hermetic avengers, which we transcend upon death and may yet transcend during life through a hermetic rebirth, are aspects of life unique to material existence and born out of the fallibility of being an embodied human, densified and limited to the conditions of this plane. Quote, nothing is uninhabited by God, for where heaven is, God is too, and where the world is, heaven is too. Much as God is inseparable and omnipresent, the hermetists regarded heaven as expansive and full of life. Quote, heaven is larger than everything, and the sun than earth and sea, for it extends beyond both of them. And in heaven are all the beings, for it contains the superior ones, and it contains the inferior, enclosing them from every side. Quote, the living beings in heaven are constituted of fire and air, and those which are on earth of the four elements. There was no mistaking it that a range of divine beings existed between the mortals and the God of all life and light. This divine hierarchy had been firmly established in the backgrounds of both the Greek and Egyptian traditions. Whether we name them daimons, immortals, gods, UFOs, or angels, the hermetists were not unaware that with enough monitoring of the heavens, through the physical eyes or that of the noose, one would surely see lights whiz and burst and blink. Thus, hermetism does not shrink from the understanding that life is spread far beyond the one world we occupy. Quote, reasonable speech is the servant of noose, for what noose wants, speech in turn interprets. This puts the Hermes back in Hermes Trismegistus. As we have seen, Plato regarded the Greek god Hermes as pertaining to discourse, divine speech, and interpretation. Hermes, as a patron of eloquence and divinely inspired speech and writing, is therefore a servant of noose. Despite the fallibility of the spoken word, a soul with noose and skill in learning may most accurately convey what noose wants. Noose being an ultimate good moving through the individual. Quote, noose sees everything, and eyes all corporeal things. And yet noose does not become an observer for the eyes, but the eyes for noose. Quote, to noose nothing is incomprehensible, to speech nothing ineffable. When you keep silent, you understand. When you talk, you just talk. Noose conceives speech in silence, which is the only manner of speech that pertains to hermetic salvation. Speech endowed with noose is a gift of God. Speech without noose is a finding of man. Here we may better understand why the hermetic authors wrote their texts under the inspired name of Hermes Trismegistus. This name differentiates their writings as being a gift in alignment with noose and not merely a finding of man. As the Neoplatonic philosopher Proclus explained, quote, Hermes governs the different herds of souls and disperses the sleep and oblivion with which they are oppressed. He is likewise the supplier of recollections, the end of which is a genuine apprehension of divine nature. If we are to move forward with this insight, we may find more meaning in the following, quote, Just as the gods are God's possession, so is man too, and man's possession is the world. If there were nobody to see it, what would be seen would not even exist. This illustrates the top-down dispersion of noetic speech, but also pronounces man as a being of powers not unlike the gods. The world being inexistent, if not for its observers, is a striking premonitory principle out of this earlier milieu, conveying that the apparent outer world is more likely a reflection of the more real internal world. If not for consciousness, therefore, and the capacity of an intelligence to engage with an apparent outside world, this outside world has no being. If we state that a thing exists empirically, this existence first empirically requires intelligence to observe it. 
without the observer anything that would otherwise be observed, for all anyone will ever know, does not yet exist as a manifested form. Quote, man has at once the two natures, the mortal and the immortal one. The hermetic definitions provide further explanation on this point, alluding to the cycles of rebirth and the manner of a soul's intelligence, which is both born into the world upon mortal birth and born into the immaterial world upon the death of our mortal encasement. Quote, Just as you went out of the womb, likewise you will go out of this body. Just as you will no longer enter the womb, likewise you will no longer enter this material body. Just as while being in the womb you did not know the things which are in the world, likewise when you are outside the body you will not know the beings that are outside the body. Just as when you have gone out of the womb you do not remember the things which are in the womb, likewise when you have gone out of the body you will be more excellent. There are a variety of ways to interpret this passage. We can find an implication that suggests... Just as our souls are limited once they are temporarily filtered through bodily existence, once the soul is liberated it will find itself in a seemingly new realm, where there are unknowns, mysteries, and other journeys to be had, similar but far more excellent than those unknowns we confront as we begin to mature in the bodily life. We may not choose to be at once filled with a plethora of information upon death, but may instead take it slowly now that we are no longer limited by time or decay, increase or decrease. Hermetica contain many passages dealing with this out-of-body state, and it is not out of the question that the Hermetic mystics brought back many ideas from their own out-of-body journeys such as the one Hermes Trismegistus relays in the poem Andres. While some academics may get squeamish about mystical interpretations, Hermes reminds us that Hermetism is a directly mystical system and not a conglomeration of words that offers zero spiritual utility. We might see the before-quoted passage as a confirmation that, while our souls are tethered to our bodies, this entire lifetime acts as a womb for our next birth at death, and our journey beyond the body necessarily brings with it a degree of what we have learned while embodied or what we haven't learned. Again, this emphasizes the power we work with in every waking moment. It is not enough to merely have faith that we will be saved and forgiven by some power outside ourselves, no matter how frivolously we have lived, but rather that we are the power that does the forgiving and saving, and should behave in a manner that allows us to judge our lives with less scrutiny once we die, ensuring at least that, if we choose to re-embody, that new life we choose is not soured by faulty intelligence, reminiscent of a life of error and straying from the way. In the Stobaean Hermetica 19, we find a more detailed basis for claiming Hermetic authors have tested the degree of a soul's free will during the out-of-body state. Quote, now the soul is an eternal intelligent reality, employing intelligence as its own rational faculty. Contemplating its own thought, it becomes cognizant of harmony. When it sheds the physical body, it remains self-determined and self-identical in the intelligible world. After a statement that there are two kinds of life and motion in the soul, it is explained, the life in accordance with intellectual reality has free will. Being immortal, we will eventually achieve a state in which there is no longer a need to re-enter any mortal womb. In this way, the soul will have finally learned all it can learn on earth, and will have greater journeys to attend to. Quote, just as the body, once it has gained perfection in the womb, goes out, likewise the soul, once it has gained perfection, goes out of the body. For just as a body, if it goes out of the womb while it is still imperfect, can neither be fed nor grow up, likewise if the soul goes out of the body without having gained perfection, it is imperfect and lacks a body. Just as you will behave towards your soul when it is in this body, likewise it will behave towards you when it has gone out of the body. This manner of pre-death self-improvement is emphasized elsewhere. Quote, one must exercise one's soul down here first, 
to arrive up there where it can behold and not slip from the path. This is a sensible declaration when we learn that, quote, nothing in the realm of the body is true. Everything in the realm of the bodiless is without falsehood. But what more is taught about this falsehood experienced in the lower realm, and why is it that such evils plague us? Quote, the good is freely chosen, evil is not freely chosen. We can compare this to many passages in Plato's dialogues, specifically in Timaeus, quote, no one is willfully evil. A man becomes evil, rather, as a result of one or another corrupt condition of his body and an uneducated upbringing. No one who incurs these pernicious conditions would will to have them. Expanding on this point, the rough school of earth, as it were, would offer less of its intrinsic value to the journeying soul if we did not confront the evils of the world brought on by forgetfulness and ignorance. The name of the game is to demand the preference of good over evil after having been born into a forgetful state of the soul's immortal purity. In this way, the soul who has now limited itself to such a densified mortality, who can yet still come face to face with God and re-member that the soul and not the body is its truest nature, becomes a testimony for all of life how powerful we actually are that we can choose collectively to forget our spiritual being and play out the idea of separation with the option of rediscovering God offers something new to a soul who otherwise lives many lifetimes in other realms, never forgetting its true nature. Because, in truth, quote, the immortal is not mortal, the mortal is not immortal. It is stated clearly that matter brings about quality, quantity, good, and evil. The soul descends into a darkness at birth, which brings on his deficiency. Quote, his deficiency is ignorance. His plenitude is the knowledge of God. For there is nothing unknown in heaven and nothing known upon the earth. Once a soul casts off the burdens of matter, it is free to engage with knowledge instantly. In previous essays, we have shown how thought and will in the out-of-body state bring instant results. In heaven, therefore, we have the freedom to instantly experience what we seek now that we no longer experience time, place, and space in a linear framework. In further testament to the existence of -of out-of-body references in Hermetica, we should point out how the Hermetic author of Poemandries explains the beginning of his visionary ascent by comparing it to sleep. Quote, Once when mine had become intent on things which are, and my understanding was raised to a great height, while my bodily senses were withdrawn as in sleep, when men are weighed down by too much food or by the fatigue of the body, it seemed that someone immensely great of infinite dimensions happened to call my name. We should not think of this as an accidental or rudimentary comparison, but rather a practical, relatable, and practicable state. Studies on OBEs at the Monroe Institute, for instance, have demonstrated the increase in theta brainwaves during out-of-body experiences. And where else do we find an increase in theta waves? During deep dreaming sleep. Moreover, if this sleep were not a special kind of sleep to Trismegistus, he would not later in the same text critique those who are still living in ignorance and tell them to cease being beguiled by dull sleep. Of course, language reliant on this sensible and sensory world falls short of the ineffable realm that hermetic mystics demonstrably sought out to achieve a mystical rebirth. Quote, divine bodies do not have access paths for sensations for they have sensations within themselves, and what is more, they are themselves their own sensations. While a disembodied soul may not have the sensory apparatus for seeing colors or hearing words, the hermetic author of the Poemandries hears his name and sees great lights and visions, regardless of how untethered he is to his body. These access paths for sensations are, in this sense, material reflections of our innate spiritual properties. Since, quote, a mortal body does not come into an immortal one, but an immortal body can arrive into a mortal one, 
it stands to reason that this immortal body must operate in the sensory world with capacities that are fundamental to its nature, namely sight, feeling, hearing, though through the as of yet unquantifiable medium of the trans spatial noetic realm. Quote, those who worship idols worship plain pictures. The idol is not the thing worshipped itself, but an image indicative of a divine and invisible thing more excellent. Once this truth is established in the mind of the worshipper, all objects and idols are permissible as meditative permission slips, and one can no longer be judged an idolater now that they have understood the material expression of a thing is not the ideal spiritual counterpart of it, but rather the most manifestable way this ideal form can be translated into the denser vibrations of matter. Indeed, the world is not a realm of chance happenings, but a synchronous environment, often confused from its immediate connection with its invisible counterpart because of the linear framework of the material time-space reality and the delays that appear to happen between noetic thought and lived experience. Chance is an unordered impulse, an image of activity, a false vision. For nature is the mirror of truth, the latter is at once the body of the incorporeal things and the light of the invisible. This distinguishes nature as not the essence of truth itself, but a reflection of incorporeal and visible truth, which is, in the hermetic sense, the actual reality. All reality is made of this noetic light and life. All life forms are contained and sustained by the inseparable God of which we are as units, cycling downward and back upward in a great motion from God to individuation and self-experience and back up to God again. For after all, quote, this is the final good for those who have received knowledge, to be made God. This hermetic theosis is further developed in the definitions. Quote, you have the power of getting free since you have been given everything. Nobody envies you. Everything came into being for you, so that by means of either one being or of the whole, you may understand the craftsman. For you have the power of not understanding with your own will. You have the power of lacking faith and being misled, so that you understand the contrary of the real beings. Man has as much power as the gods. This may yet come to be one of the most profound hermetic answers to the very severe spiritual query of, if we are made of a mortal life, light, and mind, how is it that we have come to experience the illusion of forgetfulness and separation? This passage answers such a question. It is not that God or some greater power has stripped us of our knowing, but we have brought it about by our own free will. In an infinite universe, there has to be at least one instance where souls have simulated a reality in which it is possible to choose to plunge into ignorance in order that one might rediscover what they really are and therefore bring back to the heavens a new perspective of what it means to be alive. Free will thus also implies that we are capable of subjecting ourselves to falsehoods, how else, if not for forgetfulness and free will, would we be able to experience what is contrary to the true reality? By experiencing what a soul does not prefer over and over again, it has now supercharged the certainty of what it prefers. Combine this with a compounding noetic energy, and one imagines that a recently disembodied soul becomes like a shooting streak of light into the high heavens such as those described by Plato in the vision of Ur and Ur's out-of-body journey in witness of highly powered souls soaring into new realities above those who have chosen to remain attached to the physical plane and physical desires. The hermetic author does not hesitate to reaffirm the theosis of a soul. Quote, you can even become a god if you want, for it is possible. Therefore, want and understand and believe and love then you have become it. It is further espoused that all man has a notion of God on account of being man. However, this notion may be diminished or increased through free will. But, quote, whoever knows God does not fear God. Whoever does not know God fears God. Whoever knows none of the beings fears everyone. 
Whoever knows all of them fears none. This is a striking distinction from that all-too-praised notion that to be God-fearing is somehow a noble expression of understanding, when in reality it is a confession of ignorance and a sense of guilt. This passage should come as a lesson to those as well who, in ignorance of the variety of divine beings, paint all those outside their purview as evil demons and regress into a state of fear, reaffirming their ignorance of the ultimate protection of God in their own immortality. For if any true God of all life has a scorching hellscape in store for those souls who do not abide certain dogmas created wholly by men, then all labors and efforts on earth are a hopeless folly from the start. Thankfully, Hermetism emphasizes keeping its teachings away from such careless minds who would work evil interpretations into otherwise straightforward instructions. As in the Stobaean Fragment 11, when Hermes tells Tat, But shun conversations with the common crowd. I do not want you to begrudge people, but to the common crowd you will appear ridiculous. Like is received by like, and unlike things are never friends. The hermetic definition of evil is here given as evil is a deficiency of good, which therefore satisfies us as to the question of whether evil is a thing unto itself in hermeticism. Judging by this definition, evil is a deficiency of a true existence and not an existence unto itself. It is rather an illusion brought on by the lack of the true reality of goodness. Such lofty concepts have reflections in our physical body as well, perceived in a fact as seemingly inconsequential as that of our needing 47 muscles to frown, while we need only 12 to 17 to smile. In closing, with our brief glimpse into the definitions, we see our hermetic author settle the matter of death and provide an enigmatic notion as to why the inseparable God has produced such a fragmented variety of living reflections who act out the great dances of immortality across the universe. Quote, death, if understood, is immortality. If not understood, it is death. Therefore the soul is an immortal essence, eternal, intellective, having as an intellectual thought its reason endowed with noose. By understanding nature, it attracts to itself the intellect of the planetary harmony. Then, once freed from this natural body, it remains alone with itself and is grieved, belonging only to itself in the intelligible world. It rules on its own reason. Thank you for watching this examination of some hermetic aphorisms. Let me know in the comments what you think of these teachings. Please like and subscribe, and if you would like to support the work I do here, please consider supporting the Patreon linked below in the description. Thank you.